everyone. Oh, I just realized how I sound after a long night of drinking. All right. First time. Swear to God, never drank before. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's not going to happen. All right. So thanks for uh, Hack Miami, first of all, uh, for having me. That's really awesome. Uh, even more thank you for the complete lack of guidance. <laughs> they just said, hey, do you want to do a keynote? I'm like, yeah, sure. Here's the theme. And that's it. <laughs> and that, that was awesome because it kind of challenged me to come up with, all right, so Thread Intel. <laughs> um, and I know that uh, yesterday's speaker um, had a, a certain political affiliation. And I came up with this brilliant talk for the title. Um, I laughed about it, so you, it's, it's all right. I have a weird sense of humor. What am I doing here? Um, I'm not certified for anything. I know that some, some, are you, some of you are. Uh, I'm not. I, am, uh, I work. You weren't supposed to say that. Uh, I was going through the process in the, the small e-commerce website that I work for doing security of approving me being here. And it, it came out to the like, last minute. So uh, I have a past in working in the industry for the past 20-something years. I've been doing research. I've been doing defense, a lot of offense, a lot of consulting, a lot of pen testing, red teaming, and all that fun stuff. Uh, but essentially, I'm a hacker. I've, I've been hacking since I was like wee little. Um, and the interesting thing about hacking for me is that it applies to everything. It's not just computers. It's lock picks. It's physical security. It's people. It's law. Um, you can hack anything, politics, uh, and so on and so forth. I'm one of the crazy people who set up a, a DEF CON group. Anyone involved in the DEF CON group in their local? Yeah, um, so we did that in, uh, in Israel, in Tel Aviv. That was fun. It still is uh, going strong. Uh, one of the crazy people who decided that we don't like pen testing as it is. And uh, after, a, again, a drunken night, we decided to write a standard on how to do pen testing. Uh, so that was fun for a while until it got uh, pointed out uh, as this is how you should do pen testing by the latest version of PCI standard and uh, the British standard of institute of standards or something like that. Uh, so that, again, that's, that's great. I don't know what were they drinking when they pointed to us. Uh, and last but not least, uh, still going strong as a reservist in the Israel Air Force, doing interesting stuff. All right, every talk, everyone that talks to you has an agenda. All right, everyone is biased, and instead of just, uh, what, is that for me? No, all right. Hi, honey. <laughs> um, instead of you trying to figure out what's my agenda and what's my bias, I'm just gonna spill it out, all right? I figure that's a little better than just uh, uh, trying to sell you something. So the biggest advantage that I have right now, even more so than in my previous job, as in two, two weeks ago, is that I'm not trying to sell you anything. I really don't. I mean, you're already buying, so what the hell. Uh, but not, <laughs> yeah, not on this topic. This is based on my personal experiences with the companies that I work for, with the clients that I worked for, which means it is a reflection of my narrow perspective. You might have seen different. You will experience different things. These are the adversaries that I worked with. These are the companies that I work with. And therefore, that's the information that I can give you. That doesn't mean that it will apply 100% to your situation. So you'll have to make those adjustments. Um, this is a highly fluctuating environment, the whole threat intel and intelligence environment in general. Highly fluctuating. We're seeing a lot of vendors come and go and in a lot of marketing efforts in terms of trying to explain to you what you should buy and what you shouldn't. Um, so that's, that's my agenda. That's, that, these are my biases. Take them or leave them. Um, so back to, oh, and, and of course, I'm speaking for myself, 
not for any company I used to work for or am working for. That's just like the legal disclaimer. <laughs> um, so what, what got us to talk about threat intelligence? How, I mean, last couple of years, three years, everyone's talking about threat intelligence. Everyone's trying to sell it. I want to talk about what intelligence is to begin with. Uh, not a lot of people know that. I happen to had the, the, the questionable pleasure to work in the intelligence industry uh, or to serve in the, in the intelligence industry. And it's important to understand what intelligence is before we dive into threat intelligence and, and cyber intelligence. And a lot of people get this wrong. And again, this is not a secret. You can, you can pull this off from Wikipedia. I think there's a source blur down there. Um, intelligence, let's start from the sources of intelligence. We start with operational environment, right? Just what's around us, or what's around the business. What kind of data, all right, after we collect that information, we, we have data. Um, that data needs to be distilled into information, okay? That's a process that requires uh, processing and, and explanation. That information then needs to be put in context of a target, of a goal, of an operation, of something that applies to my specific task at hand or business that I'm trying to defend or assets that I'm, again, defending or trying to promote. And there's a process of analysis and production that translates information into intelligence. So we're seeing a lot of action, there's a lot of activities in order to get to something that's called intelligence. And intelligence at the end of the day is something that I can actually use, that I can say, oh, I need to do something different now. Or, oh, I now have a different perspective on something that is going to change. And the, the, the key words here is different, is change, is action, is do something based on that intelligence. Remember that. All right, and apply it any, any time someone talks to you about intelligence or threat intelligence, and we'll talk about it later. It is that bias for action. If there's no action associated, if there's no net new that will change the way that you operate, it's not really intelligence. It's data or information. All right, and that's a key factor because a lot of times you'll end up paying for intelligence and only getting information or data. So I'm saving you some money and uh, giving you the opportunity to have some interesting discussions with peers, vendors, whatever it is. Once you have intelligence, this is basically the cycle of creating and using intelligence. Again, this is not some top secret document. It is found on the internets. Intelligence is, as I said before, always comes in the context of a mission of something that I want to do, something that I'm trying to achieve, whether it's attacking something or defending something. It involves planning and direction. First of all, you have to have some kind of idea of what the hell am I trying to do here? Is there an asset I'm trying to protect? Is there a, an asset I'm trying to get to? Collection, as we said before, of data, processing that data into information, analyzing that information into intelligence and producing intelligence and then disseminating an integration. This is a very tricky definition. Uh, this basically means applying intelligence to the right stakeholders, all right? Disseminating that information, okay? This is a good slide to capture. Um, there's the source of an adversary, whereas most of the information most of the data, and again, I'm using the terms that I used in the first slides, that we can get en masse relates to the bottom ones, all right? To malware samples that get us hash values and IP addresses if they're embedded or by behavior. And that's about it. Maybe domain names, all right? We're seeing a lot of domain names running around and being produced as parts of threat intelligence feeds and vendors, and you need to understand where those vendors fit. 
And that's, again, a key takeaway. You can't just walk in and say, all right, I need to create a threat intelligence practice for my organization to better my defenses, okay, to better combat the attackers. So I'll just go out and buy a threat feed, all right, or work with vendor A, B, or C, doesn't matter. There's no silver bullet, I'm sorry, you can't even just buy it, you need to build it internally, and we'll talk about building it. And the problem is that, again, just like cyber, threat intelligence became the big buzzword. Everyone who went to RSA can attest to it. You walk down the halls and it's like, threat intelligence this, threat intelligence that. At some point, you're even seeing, it, it's, it's just, it becomes a blur. It's like it's the same UI designer, <laughs> or everyone's using the same, <laughs> the same dashboard kind yeah. of visualization package, and they just change the colors. It all looks the fucking same. <laughs> And you're asking vendors, what is, what is it that you're producing? That's a trick question because there, you know, there are sales drones on the floor. There are no real engineers there. But they can't really give you an answer. They keep repeating the same washed up kind of briefing that they got. Next, next gen threat intelligence. Next gen, yes, yes. It helps your cybers. <laughs> and I'm, although I'm not a big fan of analyst firms, sorry. And this is a good one. This is a good quote that I stole from Forrester's latest uh, report on threat intelligence. And it pertains to, again, to the same kind of washed up, in your face, put it in the saw idea of those maps. And the quote goes like, real time attack maps of your infrastructure and your business partners' infrastructure. Right? That's what you should be looking for. Anything else is a distraction. If the attack maps, okay, <laughs> that we're seeing pushed everywhere. Oh, sorry, that, that must have been sorry. Thread bus, thread. Yeah. <laughs> Same value, all right. Same value, or just paying different currency for it. If the attack map doesn't show your infrastructure in something that relates to you specifically as a business which means your infrastructure and your partners, right? anyone that has direct impact on you, if they don't show it, it's a distraction. There's no point. I mean, it's fun, and there are sounds <laughs> of looking at this other than something fun to look, at, to look at. There's absolutely zero value, and you can quote me on it. I quoted someone else, so. <laughs> oh, that's where it was supposed to go. Sorry, PowerPoint food is weak today. I did finish this last night, and um, yes. <laughs> then, yes. <laughs> like after, I was like, oh damn, I, it's just one more thing I want to add. And <laughs> that's what happens. So how do you how do you really create intelligence? How do you? You're probably asking, all right, great, Ian, you just bashed all of the threat intelligence vendors. Good job. <laughs> and how do you go about and actually doing what you're talking about? And the first step is really understand the lay of the land. In order to do that, you need to stick, you know, pull your head out of the sand. <laughs> and yeah, I, I, I don't try to look for those images on Google search, image search. And you got it. Uh, and really, <laughs> it's a horrible experience. Uh, especially after like four shots of whatever we drank last night. Uh, and really understand what is the landscape that you're operating within. And the first thing that you'll notice, or hopefully will notice, is that your environment, the existing environment, has a lot of information that you can start utilizing before you go out, before you look at the external environments, before you look at vendors, look at your own environment, existing logs from everywhere, and I'm talking everywhere. Storage is cheap these days. The ability to analyze heaps and mounds of data is in your fingertips today, again, for free. Do it. 
It's just waiting to be used. And your ability to look at past incidents and start profiling them and start extracting or producing intelligence. Don't look just for the IOCs. Don't just look for you know the hash values and the IP addresses that were used in the past breach or in the current kind of behavioral analysis of your environment. Start digging up and creating that more quality intelligence that goes up the pyramid within your own environment. All right, step one. Yes, you are a special snowflake, and obviously you are very unique in your industry, which is very unique in the entirety of businesses and organizations. But you'll find, shocker, that a lot of other people have the same problems as you are. When you start talking, so we were kind of opening up from looking in, into my environment, into looking at other environments that are similar in my industry. And you'll find out that there are a lot of channels that people utilize, especially intelligence analysts and threat analysts, with their competitors, with their partners, with other companies and organizations in the same industry. There's a lot of data. Anyone who's worked in the malware antivirus industry knows that competitors that would kill each other to get to a client are openly sharing data in closed mailing lists and, and, and interest groups. A lot of data and a lot of intelligence, and that's just how it works. Otherwise, you're going to be doing double work, and that's not something we want to do. Find those channels of data sharing, either informal by networking in events like this, and finding other people who work in similar industries and have similar problems with similar adversaries. Again, you're looking to produce that top-notch in intelligence. That kind of intelligence pertains to a particular adversary, or threat actor, as we like to call it in the <laughs> industry. And if you look at other industries, they're not going to be the same. And the value of that intelligence is going to be zero for you. So look for those kind of data sharing. So as I mentioned before, networking, talking to people, and kind of on the, the other scale of the spectrum, you'll find a lot of a, a just more, much more organized ways to do that. Uh, ISACs, uh, CISP, anyone heard of CISP? C-I-S-S-P? All right, all right. Ah, yeah, that's a... Cyber information sharing something program, I think. It's the. Uh, I, I'm, I'm actually on it, but. <laughs> not a big fan of uh, TLAs. Um, it's, the, it's a US CERT slash Carnegie Mellon slash US government initiative to facilitate intelligence sharing between public and private and government organizations. And it's surprisingly fairly well managed. And it's been ramping up in the past year and a half, two years that at least I've been involved with in terms of moving from IOCs and simple indicators a little higher up into the up the pyramid of pain and providing better indicators and better intelligence per vertical, per industry sector. So again, there are, there are ways to do that either on the kind of ad hoc networking side or the more established ones. Do it. And make sure that, again, that you're in context because if you start picking on, you know, the, the kind of special unicorn, this is a and, and the best example that I have is uh, not to bash on them, I love the company. Kaspersky uh, had a huge campaign a few years ago. Dooku 2. Anyone remember that? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Who does Dooku 2 apply to? Wow. Well, obviously not to you, but who does it apply to? I was like, who should be scared of the Dooku 2 malware campaign? Who? 
don't say that again. Who should be scared of Dooku 2? Who was the target of Dooku 2? Yes, Kaspersky. That is the only company in the world that should give a shit about Dooku 2. All right? <laughs> There's no point of producing AV signatures for Dooku 2 if you're not Kaspersky. <laughs> That's the special unicorn, all right? So it's great to hear about it. It's phenomenal to analyze it and kind of unravel the story behind it. I think it's, it's fascinating, but it's, it's the value of something like that from a threat intelligence perspective is absolutely zero if you're not this person. Be weary of buying in or putting too much time in analyzing those kind of cases. Okay, look for your own special unicorn industry. All right, look for stories and campaigns that your peers, competitors, partners are dealing with so you can actually learn from it and apply it to your environment. Otherwise, it's nothing more than an interesting story. So how do you go about actually building those capabilities. I mentioned before that you should start looking inside. Obviously, looking inside, you can't just get a consultant. Well, you can, but it's not going to be worthwhile. You can't just get a consultant and tell him, do for intelligence. You have to start building that capability inside. Now, I'm not saying, all right, go hire a whole new team of threat intelligence analysts. No, I'm saying build the capability. Use your existing resources, your existing analysts, all right? People in the SOC, people in your, on your blue team can start doing threat intelligence work, can start working through that cycle of getting the raw data, the operational environment, and starting to process it, starting to extract data from it, distill that data into information, and so on and so forth. In order to do that, Obviously, you have to get the right people. And I usually like to hire a bunch of smart people around me <laughs> and make sure that they know what they're doing, tell them about my crazy vision, and it's like, there you go, do your magic. May the force be with you. And, and that tends to work very well. Find the people. If you have a team of five or three, find the one or two that are those Jedi masters, so to speak, in threat intelligence that get it, that have the ability to look at that cycle and say, yes, that resonates with me, I get it, I know what to do now, I know how to look for data inside the organization, I know what to look for in terms of, yes, this is a hash value that's, that I can send back to my AV company, <clears throat> and they're gonna put it in their updates and everything's gonna be fine, but that, that has, negligible value for me. So I'm gonna step it up and try to find, try to walk up the pyramid of pain to produce intelligence that I can do something about. Because that hash value has almost zero actionability from my perspective. When I talk about actionable intelligence, obviously you have to talk about threat modeling. Okay, because if you don't understand how your organization works, and what is it that you're protecting, all the threat intelligence in the world is not gonna help you. So when you're building that team, when you're building that capability internally, the first step that you should do after getting, finding the right people, is making sure that you have a threat model to work on, to work based off. A threat model, and again, this is a simplified <laughs> version, it is surprisingly much, much better than the professional slides and kind of models that you'll find on the internet because it clearly portrays what the threat model should have. Map your assets, what is it I'm protecting? That's a hard question, by the way. All right, a lot of people, when I ask them, what are the assets that you're protecting, start listing IP addresses and servers and databases. I'm like, no, that's bullshit, that's infrastructure that is supporting infrastructure for something else that might be an asset for your organization. Make that mental adjustment 
to think about business assets and find what is it in your technical infrastructure that supports it. So map the assets, understand the processes all right, around those assets. How are they being used by the organization? How are they being accessed? What are the existing protections around them? What prevents from an insider or an outsider from getting into those assets? Map those out, and then map out the threats. Who is it that's out there to get me? Without the ability to point to a threat community or a threat actor, you can't really climb up the pyramid of pain and go to tools and TTPs, right? Because tools and TTPs apply, as I mentioned before, to a specific threat actor, to my threat actor, not to someone else's. Make sure you have this in place. This, again, it may seem trivial, and I know that I've used a fun slide to present it, but it is an important one. If you don't have a threat model, build one. Trust me, it is one of the best investments that you will make as a security practitioner. One of the best. It provides focus, and it provides defensibility to any of your actions if they're based on a threat model. Any purchasing action, any hiring action, any activity that revolves around protecting assets or finding out more information about my threats becomes defensible in line of a threat model. Without a threat model, you're wasting money, time, and resources in your organization point, and you can quote me on it. <clears throat> this is one of my favorite quotes, quotes about a, a threat model. I don't know if you've seen James Mickens uh, talk before. If you have not, Google it, YouTube it. <laughs> um, this is the extreme of threat modeling, obviously. And I just like it because I'm Israeli, and every time someone mentions the Mossad, they're looking at me and like, oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> but look, again, look at your adversaries, profile them, and work in the context of those adversaries. Okay? That is the target for your threat intelligence practice in terms of gathering information, distilling it, and producing something that's applicable to your environment. And then, rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat. A threat model is not a static document. Don't bother printing it. It will become invalid within the time that the ink dries. It is a live document, it is a live base of knowledge, because it will keep, it will keep getting updated as you produce intelligence. The essence of intelligence is to give you better context and better, a better ability to take action. Part of it is getting to know your adversary better. Okay? Part of the uh, deliverables from a threat intelligence practice is changing the threat model with more information and more context about your threats. Sometimes it will be also about your assets. You will find more about third parties uh, that you depend on in terms of your assets. This is the cycle again. Collection, analysis and dissemination, and then taking action on alerts. The alerts go back. I mean, this is obviously the internal cycle. Alerts and actions can go out towards changing controls or taking action in your environment or educating people or acting. In, in the sense of blue team, as well as, as I mentioned before, updating your threat model and improving your intelligence collection. This sounds like real work. Can't I, just I know it's crazy. It's it's yeah. unheard of. That and, and again, that's the beauty of it. I I don't have a solution for you, so I'm not trying to sell you anything other than work hard, and this will be fun. I promise. Um, Adjustments. I love this graph. This is the most scientific uh, slide that I have, <laughs> as you can probably uh, obviously see. <laughs> um, this is the adjustment slide. Like anything in the world, intelligence in particular is not accurate. But 
it has the ability to get more and more accurate over time if you do, as Tim said, hard work <laughs> and get better at it. Um, and what this slide basically means is you should always strive to get into this magical line. This magical line means that, line means that the expected behavior, right? I get a, a threat intelligence alert that says actor A using, sounds like, <laughs> like a game of clue. <laughs> actor A using tool B with TTPs, IOCs, whatever it is, is going to attack asset C in such and such timing in this environment using a candle in the library. And, and then you'll do some work to get prepared to that activity. And then you'll have you'll deal with the actual event. It's going to be actor A using tool B, okay, with maybe different TTPs or IOCs than I expected. And the key is really not to say, oh shit, we missed. The key is to say, oh, we missed. And this is the miss. All right? This is the difference between the expected and the observed. And we're also always striving to be correlated or adjusted in terms of what I've, observed, I've expected and what I observed. The more we get towards that black line in the middle, the better our threat intelligence practice is. And you can only get that by providing that feedback loop. All right? Otherwise, you're just producing intelligence, which is great. It's a good start. But if you don't close that loop, you'll always have those gaps between expected and observed. Remember that? That's really the, the kind of the last mile of producing or creating a threat intelligence practice. Or Basically anything. I mean, this can be applied to anything that we do in terms of kind of retrospect, doing a debrief. This is what I wanted to get. This is what I actually got. How do I make that gap smaller and smaller? In the threat intelligence world, it's, it's extremely important. Just to sum things up, this is, this is the entire talk in one slide. All right? So if there's a slide that you want, I'll, I'll obviously provide the, the slides for you guys to enjoy the, the funny pictures. And, but this is the important one. All right, this sums up the entire process. Always start with threat modeling, and then move on. Profiling your adversaries, collect data, correlate, disseminate intelligence, produce alerts and actions based on that intelligence, debrief, critical. If you want to get better, you have to do the debrief, feedback into the thread model, rinse, repeat. That is thread intelligence, ladies and gentlemen, at least the way I see it. Again, remember the first line? At least based on my experience with the organizations that I've worked with. And with that, I hope that this was uh, somewhat entertaining and somewhat informational and helpful. If you have any questions, please feel free. I think we have a couple of minutes. Thank you. Questions? All right, I'll be around all day. Thanks.